Good morning, everyone. I have 10 o'clock here in Ohio. Um, not that time, of course, for our presenter this morning, but we're awful glad that Hillary Isabrands agreed to present for us this morning at a very early time, her time frame. Um, a couple housekeeping items before we get started. This webinar is being hosted by the Ohio LTAP Center, and we are pleased to have you on. One of the things we're doing this morning to cut down on background noise is we have everyone joining in a muted status. Um, you are welcome, though, to ask questions through the chat pod. And if you're not seeing a chat pod on the left-hand side of your screen, you should see a round circle with a thought bubble in it. You can press that, and it'll turn um, the chat pod into a view mode so you can see it. And feel free to put any questions you have in the chat pod I will be reading those off to Hillary during the um, beginning part of the webinar, and when we get to the end, I will actually unmute everyone so you can ask audio questions. Um, so other than that, I believe that the only other thing I wanted to mention is that we are attempting to record the webinar, and we're not always successful with that. Technology sometimes doesn't want to cooperate, but if we are, we'll send a link out to the webinar to everyone. Um, if we're not, it's a great thing you're here because you're going to get to experience it live. So with that, Hillary, are you all ready? Sure am. Thank you, Victoria. Thank it's a you. pleasure to be with you guys this morning. So um, I, I, again, I'm excited. I have the opportunity to, uh, to be in front of the Ohio group on a regular basis, at least uh, once or twice a year. And I really appreciate that um, you guys have a lot going on, uh, not only in, in the area of roundabouts, but in, in safety and in working at the state level and the local level um, when it comes to reducing fatal and injury crashes. So. Um, it's always a pleasure um, to be uh, with you all. So I, I always try to incorporate uh, Ohio photos when I have an opportunity. Uh, last year when I had, uh, was teaching a couple of classes on roundabouts, uh, I jumped on up to Newark, Ohio to check out the exciting uh, mini roundabouts and that transformation that they had in the town square. So um, you'll get an opportunity to see these photos um, Throughout the throughout the slide uh, presentation today, and I do believe Victoria, correct me if I'm wrong, that uh, the September 13th uh, Ohio Roundabout Conference will be in Newark this year. It's correct. Uh, we are in the con excuse me the contract stage right now, but um, there's a very large venue that's right there on the square, so it should make for a great walkable lunchtime tour of the circles on the square as they refer to it there in Newark. Thanks. All right, great. So that's um, exciting. I look forward to, to getting back to Newark uh, in the fall. So, you know, as usual, I, you're going to see some things that you've heard before from me related to roundabouts. Um, and I, the reason I do that is because it's, it's really important. It's always good to reinforce what we know about roundabouts, what we know about design, um, and how we can always have continuous improvement in ourselves as folks that are involved in roundabout projects. So um, I really think it's important to, to always reiterate, and, and I know we'll sometimes get new people, of course, on these webinars. So it's really critical that we, we cover the bases um, when it comes to roundabouts. Now, Something that I'm doing a little bit different this time than I have in the past is I'm actually leaving extra time for Q&A. So I'm going to stop a couple of times during the webinar, and that's when Victoria is going to have to, to, to be monitoring that chat pod, and she will, she will make sure that I get questions as they're coming in. But I will be prompting you with questions as we go through this today. So um, please, um, um, stay with us, and, and again, um, I want you guys to be engaged. I want to hear about what questions you have on your specific projects. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the updated guidance in Ohio um, that was uh, posted and published in, in January of 2019 as well. So looking forward to our discussion today. So we'll talk a little bit in general about your uh, guidance and your design guide as well as some of the things that are going on at the national level, some research projects. Um, again, I want to know what's on your mind. I want to know what you, what questions you're having. Um, in the past, we've talked about multi-lane roundabouts. We've talked about accessibility. We've talked about pedestrians. 
we can absolutely cover those topics again. Uh, but I really want to make sure that um, if there is something in particular that you guys want to cover that, that I am addressing that today. We're also going to talk a little bit about education. We're going to feature uh, your friends at Hilliard, Ohio, in terms of some of the things that they've done recently. And just again, it's always keeping it fresh. I think we have to we we have to acknowledge that in the world that we live in now, with social media, things are things are moving very fast. Um, we have to step up our game in engineering and in transportation and make sure that uh, when we have something like a roundabout or a pedestrian hybrid beacon or a uh, perhaps a diverging diamond interchange, that we really are changing our game in terms of how we're engaging the public, how we're engaging decision makers, um, and so we'll cover that uh, in detail as well. So let's talk a little bit about some um, opportunities. So in Ohio, this comes from uh, FARS data, so this is NHTSA's reporting of your uh, deaths that occur in Ohio. So I believe in 2017, the number was 1,179 or 1,180 fatalities or deaths in Ohio. Um, I'm going to throw a question out there, and I know I can't hear you right now, but what percentage of fatalities were at intersection or were intersection related of those 1,180 fatalities in Ohio? Just curious what you all know about the deaths that occur on the network. Hillary, they can enter their guesses into the chat pod and I'll read them off to you. Okay, so, so yeah, please go ahead and do that. Just trying to get either a percentage or if you want to have one an third. actual number. Okay, so we've got one third. 75%. Well, brave enough. Two thirds, 53%. If you're not seeing the chat pod, click on the circle with the thought bubble in it on the bottom left hand side of your screen. 70%, 65%. Looks like the percentages are all over. 70%, 75%, okay. 80%. All right. Okay, so the good news is 90, those of you that are high up there. 73.467, sorry. <laughs> okay, that's okay. No, thank you. So that's a quite the range that we have going on there. Uh, but the number of intersection and intersection related fatalities in Ohio in 2017, the official numbers from 2017 was 327. So that's about 28% of your deaths occur at intersections or are intersection related. So that is higher than the national average. Uh, the national average is typically around 24, 25%. Um, but you are one of the states that does have, does track above uh, 1,000 uh, fatalities per year on the roadway network. And the good thing is, is, is that the state um, has in place their strategic highway safety plan um, where they really do emphasize the importance of intersections and intersection safety. And how, what, how can we change the numbers? How can we change the trends when it comes to intersection uh, fatalities and serious injuries. And so one of the things that we, that Ohio has acknowledged is that they really see that roundabouts are one of those uh, countermeasures or designs that really can bring those numbers down. And so there is the, the plan, the current plan that you guys are under is through 2019. So that is more than likely being updated right now. Victoria, is that the case? Yes, Michelle May and her group are working on it along with the committee. Okay, great. So what we will more than likely see, of course, is intersections will probably continue to be an emphasis area within the state of Ohio. Um, but oftentimes, sometimes the strategies and uh, the goals that the state will be looking at, um, so they, they evolve um, every time a, a plan is, is redone or updated. And, you know, again, roundabouts are one of those that can be an opportunity in rural environments, an opportunity in suburban, an opportunity in urban environments. Um, but by acknowledging the fact that roundabouts are one of those strategies uh, when it comes to safety as well as operational improvements, that is an, that is an important piece um, of, of really taking a look at what the issues you have out there on the system and then finding a solution that not only can reduce fatal and injury crashes, but as we know with the statistics that we have nationally in the United States and internationally, that roundabouts save lives. Um, and that is really, really important um, piece that we have to make sure that we acknowledge when we are considering 
uh, roundabouts as one of the alternatives um, as you might be uh, planning or designing a, um, an intersection. So stay in tune with that if you want more information about that whole process in terms of, of updating the Strategic Highway Safety Plan. Um, please reach out to Victoria and she can get you additional information uh, on that. All right, let me make sure I can advance here. Okay, so as I mentioned, I'm going to repeat some things that I've talked about before. And I just mentioned this, well-designed roundabouts save lives. Uh, hands down, we know that that happens. Um, and some might say, well, we know that there's some fat fatalities at roundabouts. Yes, there have been some fatalities or deaths at roundabouts. Um, we, are, we monitor those. Um, if any of you are on the listserv, the roundabouts listserv, uh, if there is a fatality, typically that gets posted out there. The, the important acknowledgement is, is that it doesn't happen very often. Um, and that's our goal as engineers, as transportation professionals, is to, uh, is to ensure that the design is, is good and that uh, people are safe as they drive through these intersections and through the roundabouts. So we really do and have established here in the U.S. a good track record um, related to roundabouts in terms of, of reducing fatal and injury crashes. Part of that is, is the speed control and the speed consistency. We've completely changed the dynamic of an intersection. Um, and that is critical to the success when it comes to the safety of the roundabouts. All vehicles are traveling between 15 and 25 miles an hour. Again, for those of you who might not know, there are roundabouts out there that do have approach uh, posted speeds upwards of 65 miles per hour. And the beauty of that roundabout is that you get all traffic to come between 15 and 25 miles an hour typically. So you've reduced that probability of there being a high impact uh, speed type of a crash. So that is so, so important as we look at um, what really does create that safe environment with the roundabout. We also know that the circular fashion really um, the number of conflict points and the counterclockwise movement also reduces the probability of a injury producing crash. And I just want to reiterate this because it's so important when we get out there, when we're doing projects, um, oftentimes we might know these, we might know that this is, you know, roundabout save lives and all speeds are between 15 and 25 miles an hour and the reduced conflict points for a single lane roundabout is eight to eight, um, eight vehicle vehicle conflict points. But the general public sometimes doesn't know that. The, the stakeholders, uh, decision makers don't know that. And we always need to remember, go back to the basics when we are talking and we are communicating and we are trying to make sure that, that people understand why roundabouts can be the preferred alternative. Right sizing the roundabout to fit the context and the users will avoid overdesign. So again, I think that there was a, I know that there was a recent ICE webinar that was looking at, uh, and actually the National Association of County Engineers had a recent webinar looking at mini roundabouts and compact type roundabouts. Um, and it's really kind of stepping back and thinking about, uh, you know, what is the right diameter um, for a roundabout, depending on the traffic volume that you have, the, the modes that you have there, and the space that you actually have. So. Hopefully those of you that have looked at the design, the updated design guidance, you will notice that there has been a change or a revision in terms of kind of uh, looking at the range of values in terms of right sizing the roundabouts. And we'll cover that more in just a bit. The phasing design construction can reduce risk with traffic projection. Again, uh, much of, of Ohio is booming. Um, it's, it's amazing to me every time I go back to Ohio how, many, how much new construction there is, um, buildings going up and, and the, just the population in general. And so it's, it's predicting what that traffic is gonna be 10, 15, 20, 25 years out is more and more challenging. And we have the ability through our project development process really to sit back and, and really identify and do a sensitivity analysis in terms of where we think we're gonna be 10 years out, 15 years out, 20 years out and make informed decisions about our designs, our number of lanes that we have. And this goes for more than just roundabouts. This can also go for 
uh, traffic signals and the number of left turn lanes or right turn lanes that you have at a traffic signal, or how many lanes that you have across the structure, a big investment on a, on a large bridge that you might have going over the roadway. So these are all things that we can, we can definitely learn from, um, but keeping that in mind and using our engineering judgment is so critical. That's, hopefully that's why many of you went to school and are in the transportation profession is because you really liked problem solving and you really like to be challenged in terms of, of having that, that good design. So it's very exciting that we officially, there is a project underway to update the NCHRP 672 guide, which has been around, officially published in 2010, uh, but really was probably done in the 2009 timeframe. And there is, uh, I, I do sit on that panel, and we actually have a panel meeting next month uh, where we're going to be uh, working with Kittleson. Kittleson is the, the primary um, contractor on that update to that guide. There's also an opportunity to do some additional research as a part of that NCHRP project. That, that's actually 03130 for those of you that are following that. Um, and so, and many of you may have had an opportunity or several of you may have had an opportunity. There was a survey that went out so before Christmas really to get feedback and input on the current guide, what's missing, what are the gaps, um, what folks would like to see integrated into the new guide. So uh, stay tuned on that. We do hope that, you know, it's probably going to be 2021 by the time that ultimately gets published, just through the process that it actually takes. Uh, but if you, if you want updates on that, we will continue to do that through ITE and through the TRB meetings um, that are held regularly. So, but rest assured, uh, all the research that has been out there, uh, we have, I think there's over 20 to 30 research type projects that have been completed since the 2009, 2010 timeframe that will be integrated into uh, the new guide uh, as the, or the update of the guide um, that will be coming out again, um, no later than 2020, but stay tuned because we, we do oftentimes and, and we know in the world that we live in now, uh, that we don't want to wait till 2021. Um, again, anything that's, that's out there that's published that has um, been vetted through the roundabouts um, community really is, is fair game for the update to the guide. So we're excited about uh, that and glad that that is moving forward. Another research project that Federal Highways is actually leading, it's part of the pooled fund study or pooled fund program. Um, and you'll see there the partners, uh, if you look halfway down through the screen, the partners. City of uh, Hilliard has uh, put forth some funds. You've got the Ohio DOT that has put forth, um, sorry, not the Ohio DOT, it's uh, City of Hilliard. You've got Connecticut DOT, Florida DOT, Georgia DOT, New York DOT, and Wisconsin DOT have all put funding towards this pooled fund program. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the pooled fund program, um, basically there's a solicitation, um, an idea that goes out there when people are interested uh, and people usually means a DOT, a local agency, a research entity, a Federal Highway Administration, you can put forth some funds um, and ultimately if there's enough funds to move forward with the scope of the project, then it, a solicitation goes out, a uh, contractor is hired, and, and you're moving forward. So this project is moving forward. I'm happy to say um, that uh, it's lit, the city of Hilliard is the, the local representation there, so I'm happy to have them on the, the group. But really what they're looking at is they're going to be going out and doing some field data collection. Um, some of that will occur. Um, I believe they were thinking, I don't know if they've gotten out there yet, but Ohio, Indiana, Wisconsin, Minnesota, maybe the New York area and the Florida area. We're, we're going to have uh, sites that are having issues with uh, multi-lane roundabouts that are having issues with crashes and then multi-lane roundabouts that are not having crash issues. And, and doing, looking at geometrics, looking at traffic volumes, looking at driveways, access points. So that is well underway. The data is going to be collected starting really here in this May timeframe and, and moving forward. So um, uh, Justin Banson from, from Kittleson is a part of that, as well as um, um, Alejandra and, and so many other folks that are, are working on that particular project. If you want more information about that, you can actually go to the pooled fund program. Um, but I know many of you probably in Ohio are tracking that. Um, you, you do have some multi-lanes uh, out there that have had some, some crash, uh, PDO crash problems. 
Uh, it has happened elsewhere in the United States, and that's why there is interest, obviously, from the other GO, uh, DOTs as well. So um, that's a good one to follow. And, and if you need more information, you can contact me, or you can go to the website, or you can actually ask Letty Champ from the city of um, Hilliard. So I'm sure she'd be happy to, to talk with you about that. And Federal Highways also has a turbo roundabout study that is ongoing. Uh, we have a draft report uh, for the, the turbo roundabout uh, study, really more or less a lit search. And of course, we do have to rely on our international uh, friends, the Netherlands, Germany, and others that have embraced turbo roundabouts. Um, some of you on the call might not, maybe not familiar with that term, um, but really it's, it's a different type of design as well as it has raised channelization, uh, at least in the Netherlands on the approaches and in the circulatory roadway. You can see that um, in that image actually on the screen, there's raised features and then you've got the pavement marking in the circulatory roadway. Hillary, I'm going to jump in real quick um, because I had a question I was actually saving for the Q&A part, but it's related to this topic. It says, has there been any research in implementing turbo roundabouts in the United States? So I take it that's so, yeah. so this yeah. is this is it, right? So we um, there has been numerous. I'm going to say numerous. I'm going to say multiple agencies that have um, have been exploring turbo roundabouts. Jacksonville, Florida will be the first community with a turbo roundabout. Um, Colorado has looked at them. Actually, um, there's been some interest in, in Ohio with turbo roundabouts. I think there continues to be some interest. Um, Brian Moore at Arcadis is, is on the team. Um, and and it, is, it is, again, more of a, a lit search and fact finding. And then really, how would a turbo roundabout work in the United States? We have to think about, you know, our, our fleets, our, our truck fleet. We have to think about in the northern climates. We have to think about what that raised channelization looks like in terms of plowing, in terms of maintenance. One of the things that we've identified in the U.S. with um, that has a, um, I guess, peculiar number of crashes with motorcycles, um, high speed, uh, high speed motorcycle crashes at roundabouts that we identified through a federal highway study. We have concerns with the channelization with motorcycles. And so it's not that it, it can't and won't be done. It is going to happen. Um, and again, Jacksonville, Florida, someone has to be first. Um, and it's really finding the optimal location, uh, doing the education. Uh, but one of the things you can see there is you really are slowing down. You really have to slow down on the entry. It is more of the, the T intersection style design, which of course, does conflict with what we talk about in terms of the deflection with, uh, on the approaches to modern roundabouts. So this, I, I do see this as, as coming. Um, I do see this as something that we need to get our hands on. And we're hoping that this study really does help us um, have a better understanding of not only what has happened internationally, but how it can be potentially implemented in the United States and really kind of maybe coming up with a US version of the turbo roundabout given again, our, our fleet vehicles um, and, um, you know, some of our, our northern climates get feet and feet of snow. Does that look different than, you know, a, a turbo roundabout in Florida? So stay tuned on that. Um, again, uh, Brian Moore, who maybe some of you know there in, in Ohio at Arcadis, is a part of that team um, as well. So now, one of the most exciting things to talk about today is the update on your roundabout guidance. So hopefully you all know that this was updated in, in January um, of 2019. And of course the red text is indicating the information that changed. And if you actually dig into 403, you will see basically all the text changed in section 403. Um, the introduction there uh, in 401.2.3 um, they uh, talked a little or made some clarification on interim design year. So I want to pause here. If you are on, um, if you have access to this chapter, um, bring it up. Um, what questions do you have in terms of the updates? I mentioned that, that um, like, for example, the, the diameter of the roundabout, um, the, the values that are included in the document are different than they were before. There's a range of values that wasn't, that didn't exist before. So, I'm actually going to pull up the guide, and I'm hoping that you're all typing in the chat pod 
in terms of anything that you, um, and I'm not, I'm, I, you know, I, I don't want to speak for Ohio DOT, but if you had any questions about the updates or you have things that you think are good with the updates, things that you want to share with the group, um, again, I'm hopefully facilitating some ideas that you all have that you can share with each other as well. Hillary, there's a question that is in the chat pod, and it refers to the third edition of the guide. So I'll leave it to you to decide which guide they're talking about. Um, but it's from Letty, and she said, do you think the third edition of the guide will include stronger guidance on fish hooks versus traditional signs and markings? What about the straight, strong yield line versus curvilinear edge line extended with shark's teeth? All right, so thank you, uh, Letty, for that question. So it is yet to be determined um, through, the, through the NCHRP 03-130 project what additional research will occur as a part of that project. So it is possible that there will be um, some marking, signing uh, elements of the research. That's part of our next meeting uh, with the panel, with TRB staff, and with the, uh, the con contractor is to basically uh, look at the interim report and, and, then, and then make a decision as, as a group, as a team, in terms of what will be funded in terms of research for part of that project. So Letty, I, that topic has come up. I, that shouldn't be a surprise to anyone that's been following uh, roundabouts for a long time. Um, but we don't, there's not a decision yet as it relates to that NCHRP project, but we should know soon. Any other questions, Victoria? Not right now, but they're more than welcome to type them in and I will definitely read them off to you. Okay. So again, I'm hoping that most of you knew that there was an update. Um, again, that red text indicating that, that pretty much that whole section on roundabouts was rewritten. Um, hopefully um, you're seeing some things that you didn't see before that um, are of interest to you. Um, I'm just gonna pull up a, a couple here. I, Victoria, are you seeing this PDF that I'm showing? Oh yeah. You are. Yep, we sure okay. are, All right. no problem. Okay, so uh, I think it's the next. So you right know, here, go ahead. I say, and it could be too, if this is brand new information to people um, that, you know, they need some time to digest it too, so. For sure. So hopefully by bringing this up, you guys are, are interested, you're excited. Um, I just brought up the, the page on the typical inscribed uh, circle diameters. You can see there the range of values. So that is really, really helpful. I think uh, prior to the, the previous uh, version of this, it just had one number. It had one diameter. And I think from the feedback that I got from some of the roundabout classes was that was a, that was a barrier. That was kind of a stumbling block because there was one diameter. Um, and now the range of values is, is more consistent with is out there with actually both NCHRP 672 as well as some of the other state DOTs that provide that range of values. So I think this is a great, um, again, it, it, it wasn't that you couldn't have a different uh, ICD for, for any of these um, variations of the roundabout, but, but sometimes I think it was, it was, from what I had heard, it was holding people back. And so I think that this is one of, an example of a great improvement. Okay, so I'm gonna leave that there. If there's anything that comes up as we continue on, um, please uh, put it in the chat pod, or you can also, again, at the end of the session, um, sounds like we're gonna, we're gonna open up uh, the phone lines as well. But I hope you guys are as excited as I am about those updates. All right, and this is also, so what's on your mind? Um, what's going on in Ohio related um, to roundabouts? Um, whether it's in the rural environment, um, it's, it's maybe a new interchange. I know I've reviewed a couple of interchange projects that have roundabouts. Um, I've seen a design with a teardrop um, for in, in Ohio. Um, there's some rural roundabouts. I know that some questions have come up. So again, what's on your mind? And while you're thinking and generating those questions for the group here, I'm just going to share um, some photos. Um, I'm always a um, excited to see a new roundabout or a roundabout uh, at night versus during the day. Um, or if I'm on a plane and I can get a good shot out my window, I'm always excited to, um, again, uh, learn more and, and go back and and um, to see the different variety and variations that we have of roundabouts across the country. Hillary, you, you sound a little bit like me that I'll actually take a detour 
a slight detour on a, a vacation just to go drive a roundabout that I've heard about. And my kids know that too. They're like, oh, mom, roundabouts, <laughs> really? <laughs> so, For um, sure. yeah, there's For a question sure. that just came in. So what is the latest research on multi-lane roundabout design elements and the relation to confusion PDO crashes? Okay. So really that pooled fund study that I indicated earlier, um, that is one that we are, we really, that is the research that's ongoing right now looking at multi-lane roundabouts. And what are the contributing factors? Is it confusion? Is it our signing and marking? Is it the, the geometrics? Because we really have had a hard time nailing it down, uh, generally speaking, or globally. Sometimes you can go and look at a specific roundabout, multi-lane roundabout, and be like, okay, I think that that's what's contributing to, you know, the PDOs or the confusion. But you go to another roundabout that might look similar, and that's not the case. And so that's why this is, it's, um, we've struggled with the multi-lane PDO issue to some extent, because it doesn't seem to apply globally everywhere when you've got a multi-lane. And, you know, for those of you that have heard Letty Champ from Hilliard talk about her multi-lane roundabouts, and then you've got, um, of course, Dublin has quite a few multi-lane roundabouts. Um, there's discussion about the two, the two by one, so two lanes and one lane versus the two lanes and two lanes, so two lanes circulating, two lanes entering. Um, now we've got some three laners in there. So this is, this is, we're trying to get more case studies, so to see if we can find some trends. But right now, um, there's a lot of theories and hypotheses in terms of what's going on with PDO crashes um, at multi-lane roundabouts. And again, contributing factors can be driveways, it can be access points, it can be origin and destination, where are you going to after you get through the roundabout. Um, it can be a peak period versus an off-peak period. And so um, that pooled fund study is the one that you really want to be watching uh, right now, as well as potential research that uh, is going to be coming out of the NCHRP 03130. So um, in the meantime, um, we, we, there are local agencies that are happy to talk to you about some of the issues that they've had with PDO crashes. Um, I think it is fair to say that education, um, we can always do better with education. Um, and I'm going to talk briefly um, in a minute just to and highlight some of the things that have been going on um, in Ohio. I've got a, a few more questions for you that have come in. Um, it says, what are issues to look out for with a roundabout constructed in a commercial warehousing industrial park where much of the traffic will be trucks? So one of the best things to do is to immediately engage those businesses, um, industries, be talking to them about their fleet, be talking to them about, you know, what's, what are they hauling? Um, is it something that can tip? Uh, what, what is the largest vehicle they have? What's the widest vehicle that they can have? So we have many roundabouts across the country that are either on truck routes, on oversized overweight routes, or just are in a location that have a lot of trucks coming in and out that would be utilizing the, uh, utilizing the roundabout on a regular basis. So hands down, the best thing you can do is engage that stakeholder and talk to them about what their needs are, about their vehicles, and then work that into the design. No different in a, in a farming area, you really want to engage the farmers. What kind of vehicles do they have going through there? What kind of equipment do they have going through there? And then having that wherewithal to really modify, maybe it's, it's a curbing, or maybe it's the location of a sign, or maybe it is the truck apron, that you can modify the design to make sure that it is going to be to work for that. And now what I'm talking about is not just your typical design vehicle, right, where you've got maybe 3% trucks. And so what I guess interpreted from this question was, is you really have it maybe at some point in time, you've got 25, 30% of these trucks going through where you really want to make sure that the design features are adequate for, um, for those types of vehicles. So there's so much to be said of having a conversation um, with our stakeholders, with the users, to make sure that we're, that is accounted for. There's a great story out of Iowa where um, in a rural area uh, where they had a farmer that didn't actually own the property, the adjacent property to the intersection, 
but they farmed the property on all four quadrants. And so that farmer actually really became a quasi part of the design team, um, talking about how he moves the equipment from one side of the road to the other, um, what needs that they had, reinforcing actually an outside blister apron um, on a couple of the radii for the intersection. And so that's ultimately a win-win for not only the users, but also for the designers and the, and the agency who owns, um, owns that intersection. Hillary, they took you seriously, and I've got about 10 questions now in the chat pod. Oh, so Good. I'm going to start reading them off, and as you finish your response, let me know, and I'll read you the next one. Um, so the next one is, is it possible to use SIDRA, and it's spelled S-I-D-R-A, to analyze a teardrop roundabout? All right, so I, I always say that, you know, whatever tools that you're using, I don't know, Victoria, is that me? Or hear that noise? I didn't hear any noise. Okay, all right, maybe it was me then. Okay, okay. so uh, in terms of Sidra, I think that you know, no, no matter what tool you might be using, an analysis tool you might be using, um, I think that when it is atypical, so I'll call a teardrop maybe atypical in terms of the design because you have to think about the geometry, you have to think about the, um, the movement of the traffic because you basically have shut down um, you know, that, that approaching leg. And so forgive me, I'd be drawing on a flip chart if we were all together. That approach leg that's at the bottom of the teardrop, there's no conflicting vehicles, right? And so that's going to affect how that particular approach then influences the the next approach, and it might perhaps have some reverse um, reverse uh, effect in terms of that approach and, and getting the gap. And so I think the best thing to do is, again, document, use your engineering judgment. Um, we could ask the same question about um, how you might uh, tweak uh, highway capacity manual equations or HCS or even how you might tweak Rodell to basically create um, to create the situation where you've got the teardrop. And I know I've had some conversations um, with some of the, I would say, the elite uh, folks that are using the roundabout tools, and they say, hey, you know, you got to use your engineering judgment. You got to think about, you know, maybe the, the headways are a little bit different. And, and each of those, well, particularly Rodell and Highway Capacity Manual Equations, you know, you can be tweaking, you can be tweaking those to make them more customized for your situation. Don't let it hold you back, but you definitely need to make some assumptions. And I would always say, make sure you have someone else that peer review, have someone take a look at what your assumptions are. But, but don't let it hold you back. Okay. okay All right. Have there been any studies on pedestrian safety at roundabouts? So the, the research that's out there on pedestrian safety at roundabouts, most of that has come from our accessibility research that is done both by NCHRP and Federal Highway Administration. So uh, the, the, I would say more of the original or the first research was under NCHRP 674, I have that right now, looking at um, multi-lane roundabouts and channelized turn lanes, uh, looking at accessibility of roundabouts. And then the most recent publication, again, dealing with accessibility, but it's pedestrians, is uh, NCHRP P834, and that's research um, that they just actually finished up um, some going out into the field and doing some workshops in that area. And then Federal Highways did some research looking at rectangular rapid flash beacons at multi-lane roundabouts, again, with sight-impaired pedestrians. However, we can learn a lot from whether you're sighted or you have uh, impairment with sight. Um, you can learn a lot by looking at those accessibility that research and then applying it to um, pedestrians in general. There's also case studies that are out there that have um, actually many of them old -er, um, where they've looked at pedestrians. But most of our, and I would say most by meaning almost all of our research related to pedestrians have been focused on accessibility, but it is relatable. Um, absolutely. It's absolutely relatable to pedestrians. Um, I think you do need to think about, you know, if a roundabout's near a school, um, what does that look like? Uh, Bend, Oregon put out some great uh, workbooks for, for elementary age kids, thinking about how you cross the road near a roundabout. Um, we've got roundabouts all across the country in school campuses where you might have uh, a teenage drivers. 
in particular, actually just 20 miles down the road here, we have a whole school campus with a high school, middle school, elementary school, and a, a charter school where there's roundabouts um, that, have, that, that are part of the intersection network. So um, that's what I can point you to. And Federal Highways, uh, that research, again, that was part of what we call our TOPR 34 series, and that can be found on Federal Highways um, Office of Safety Roundabouts web page if you want to dig into the details um, more so with the research related to pedestrians. Okay, next question. Is there any roundabout lighting guidelines in, and they put TEM, meaning Traffic Engineering Manual, or other ODOT manuals? So off the top of my head, I would need to check in terms of what ODOT has related to lighting and roundabouts. Um, maybe there's someone else out there that knows the answer to that question. Um, generally speaking, there is guidance in NCHRP 672 um, that comes really from the North American Illuminating Society, um, some research that was done very early on. We do see variations uh, out there related to, like Minnesota has lighting standards, Colorado actually has some for roundabouts. Um, in the South, you know, they have done some assessments in South Carolina looking at, you know, four lights versus uh, eight lights, and, and does that make a difference, or how does that make a difference? Interestingly enough, the images on the screen right now, um, that is a state highway going uh, through Grand Teton National Park. There is no overhead lighting. There is no roadway lighting at this roundabout. Um, there, is, uh, there is illumination. Um, you actually see the, the chevron, the directional arrows there. There is illumination in the sign. Um, but this, again, being in a national park, um, very sensitive in terms of the amount of lighting that they have. There's no other lighting um, in the park. Uh, so this is, this is maybe an extreme example for some folks in terms of um, not having lighting. Um, very few roundabouts don't have lighting. I, I will mention that. Um, and I think that this is an area, I'm giving my personal opinion here, that we, we could do more research on. Um, Hillary, honestly, there's a... The lighting. I'm yeah. sorry, I want to interrupt because Michael Cronball did put a response and he said, yes, it is in the L&D Volume 1 and TEM in regard to the current lighting question per roadway engineering. So there you go. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Okay, we can go to the next one. All right. A double roundabout has been approved by the state of Ohio for my township. Do you have any pictures of double roundabouts? Is there information you can share about them? Sure, and I want to make sure I know what the double roundabout is, so it's probably two roundabouts that are somehow connected, and if I'm incorrect, please correct me. Um, so, yeah, so double roundabout, where typically that's where you've got two that are very close together. Yes, she said there yes. Are examples out there, and, if, and whoever that person is, if they want to get in touch with me, um, I can shoot them examples. If for those of you that are on the, uh, on the call right now, if you know of a double roundabout that you want to share with this individual, please do. But please reach out to me. My contact information will be at the very end of this. And um, based on your context, we can find some examples for you. Okay, next. It says, not a question, just a statement. In Oberlin, we will be designing three mini roundabouts on existing three-way intersections as part of a resurfacing project, mainly for speed control. So I'm going to go to the That's next. great to hear. Next question. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, it says, what is it? What exactly does ODOT mean when they state, avoid designing strictly for R1, R2, R3 relationship as described in roundabouts, an informational guide, since this can result in a very tight design for trucks to negotiate? Okay, so I'd have to look exactly at that language, but the R1, R2, R3, R4, R5 are the basically the radii, the entry radii, the circulating radii, the right turn, the left turn, and the exiting radii of the roundabout. So um, it's, we may need to get some interpretation of that, and again, not having the language in front of me. Um, I think it's just being cognizant. Um, we, we typically say that you don't want um, much more than uh, five to 10 mile per hour difference in each of those radii. Um, for those of you that are familiar with the offset left design, um, we know that our exit radii sometimes isn't even a radii. It is actually a tangent when we do the offset uh, left design. And so um, I think basically the, it, it sounds like it's, it's, it's saying use your engineering judgment, um, be, be flexible, but document what you 
document what you have done. And I think that flexibility that I'm hearing in that statement is a good thing. Great. I've got the next question for you here, but I want to mention to Christine, who was asking for the image of the double roundabouts, that there is a link that's been added in the chat pod at the very bottom um, from one of the other folks. So the next question is, in rural locations with high-speed approaches, what are the thoughts on providing openings in the splitter islands to allow access to residential properties? So I think it's a great idea. I think, um, again, you're going to see a variety and a variation of the Splitter Island lengths um, across the country. Uh, for those of you who have sat in a class with me, um, know that I, you know, I guess I, I have a strong um, opinion on the practice in that area in terms of not overdoing it, um, even though you have a high speed approach. So I think opening up the Splitter Islands, whether it's for a, a, a driveway to a, a private residence, uh, access a field entrance into farming area, or it's into a business. That's absolutely something that can be considered. We do that in the urban and suburban environment all the time. And again, um, you, have to, you have to look at, at, at the particulars of the project, but absolutely that is, that's the beauty of the roundabout design is you've got that flexibility. Um, it, it is important that you have a decent uh, length. There's guidance in 672 on looking at 100 to 200 feet length of that splitter island. Um, and again, I know some, we do see some that are longer than that, but it, it absolutely should be something that um, is, it can be ex acceptable if it's designed properly. Okay, next question. Do you have any guidance on when to consider using LED yield signs? If used, do you recommend installing on right or left side of approach? So LED yield signs. So I'm trying to think. I can think of one location that I'm aware of in Minnesota where they do have the LED yield signs um, at a roundabout. They actually have the LED signs on the advanced warning signs as well. And, um, you know, obviously the, the, the yield sign on the right is required, right? That, that actually um, is one of the only requirements in the MUTCD for a roundabout is that yield sign. The supplemental sign on the left for the yield sign, um, again, it's supplemental. Um, I like to see it. You can actually see that the image that I'm showing right now, the upper right, um, it's actually cut off on the left one. But the upper right, it actually has a supplemental yield, and actually the bottom right actually has a supplemental yield. Um, so by no stretch of the imagination am I an expert on putting the, the LEDs on yield signs, but the one on the right is the, is the sign that is required for sure. Um, and there is guidance in there on you know, the color of the lights for yield signs. So the, the, the location, I can get you the location. I can look up, um, I can't think of it off the top of my head, uh, in Minnesota, it's near New Prague, Minnesota, um, that actually there's an east-west state highway that has some LED lighting um, on advance and on the yield line, or at least they used to. I can't say that they have them today. Um, but again, that can be one that we can follow up on too. But again, the one on the right is the one that's required per MUTCD, and again, is one of the only signs that is required for a roundabout. Okay, next question. Are the use of reverse curves to slow traffic on high-speed approaches still a useful technique, or is better signing replacing this idea? So I think that's absolutely uh, the reverse curves are an acceptable practice. Um, it's been around in the U.S. since we've had uh, roundabouts. Um, it's predominantly used, um, it's more of an Australia type, Australian type design uh, versus what we see in the U.K., it is acceptable, and I think there's a lot of different ways you can do it. Um, we would need to talk about, you know, what we're talking about in terms of the reverse curve. Is it gradual? Is it abrupt? Um, and and I think that if if you've got the right way, if it if it's right for the context, sometimes we introduce the reverse curve um, to help achieve our offset left. So it, it definitely is acceptable. I think how you do it is important, and and kind of the devils in the details at that point in time when you look at the reverse curves. I think you're seeing much more of kind of a blended approach now uh, than you did 10 or 15 years ago. It used to be kind of the extreme reverse curve or it was more of the kind of the flare design um, that we saw. And now you're seeing more of a blended 
type design that I, I actually um, I kind of gravitate more to the the blended type design at this at this point in time. Okay, then remember all these questions kind of came in at once. So if this one's already been answered, oh, let sorry. me let me know. It says, what specific roadway lighting design guidelines and standards would you recommend us go by? For example, IES RP 8-14. So, yeah, and so that's what's referred to in NCHRP 672. Um, and I also, again, I think you have to look at the context. So I'll get, again, I'll give you the example. In South Carolina, they, when they started to uh, implement roundabouts, they had no lighting in rural environments. So no intersections had lighting. So all of a sudden, wow, now we have roundabouts. How do we, how do we light it? It seemed, and, and from their perspective, the, some of the guidance seems maybe a little bit extreme. And so they had to find the right balance. So they worked, they actually didn't have really illumination engineers or lighting engineers on staff. So they really had to um, work internally to decide what, what their comfort level was with the lighting. Again, in Minnesota, there is actually is, there's actually um, quite a few lights that are required. I say that this is one that you have a, a great conversation internally with, with your agency about um, your, your comfort level, you know, what do you do at a stop controlled intersection? What do you do at a signalized intersection with the same context? And I think that is an important piece. We always say, you know, light up conflict points. But if you've got really good illumination, good signing, you've got maybe raised pavement markers, there's other ways, I call it the conspicuity of the intersection. And that includes pavement marking, signing, and lighting. And so sometimes it's a combination and geometry. It's a combination of those things that are going to draw attention to the intersection. Um, and again, go back to your stop controlled intersections, go back to your signalized intersection. What kind of lighting do you have in those? And then make sure that you're not overdoing it. Hillary, I wanted to add in too, there was a comment that came at the bottom. Um, it says per section 400 of the LND, quote, lighting must be provided per traffic engineering manual, TEM section 1140 slash, or excuse me, um, dash 4.6.1 roundabouts. Okay. All right. Thank you. No so problem. again, I mean, that's where you guys need to start. If that's the guidance that you guys have, you need to start there. But again, there's not a whole lot of research on lighting at roundabouts. So that's where the engineering judgment comes in. And that's where having the ability to make decisions and be flexible and look, maybe look for an opportunity to do an assessment of lighting, whether it's a rural, suburban, or urban environment. Um, this, is an, this is an area that we haven't completely figured out, I'm gonna be honest, from a national perspective. Okay. So uh, Victoria, I'm thinking maybe let's pause sure. here. I'm gonna go through some more slides and then we'll come back to questions. Sounds Thank great. Thank you guys so much for the great questions. Okay, so this is a slide that you guys have seen before. Why are peer reviews good? Okay, so I really am a believer in the peer review. Um, I think we, we, whether it's formal or it's informal, it helps everyone. Um, and I, you know, I'm still saying that roundabouts are still fairly new. Now, depending on where you are in Ohio, that, that might be the case. But new can mean new for drivers, new for um, a, a particular community, or new for the designer, or new for the contractor. And sometimes roundabouts can be misunderstood. And again, we're going to talk about education in just a minute. Um, again, not everyone uh, is coming out of school with roundabout design experience. Um, and so it, it sometimes takes folks some time to get up to speed. It's also okay that not everyone is a roundabout, you don't have a roundabout expert on, in your agency. Again, that's where we have to lean on each other and learn from each other, which I think Ohio does a great job with your conference and your webinars, that you are able to um, you know, share from peer to peer in terms of your experiences. Um, you know, a review in the project development process can reduce risks and time. And again, early on, the earlier you get another set of eyes on a design, the more likely um, if you need to make some changes, you can make it on earlier in the process versus later in the process. And I really do believe that, that peer reviews can result in a better project. Um, I absolutely, from what I've, peer reviews I've done all across the country and probably at least 50% of the states, 
Um, I really think that the engagement, the team, I always say it's a team approach. And whether that's the, the consultant, a DOT, a local agency, federal highways, um, even community input, stakeholder input, that makes a better project. And I think the more that we um, work together, the better projects that we can ultimately have. So I know some of you have heard me say this before, um, but I, I tell you what, I'd rather have another set of eyes on, on a project. Um, sometimes we get so, um, you know, we, if, if you're really intimate with the project, sometimes we have our blinders on. And not because it's intentional, but because it just, that's the way it happens. You're, 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 in, you're in the weeds. And so sometimes just a fresh perspective can be really powerful. And this can be done, again, within your own agency. It can be done with another agency. It can be done with an on-call contractor. It can be done through Federal Highways Peer Program. Um, there's a lot of different ways that you can get another set of eyes on a project um, that can make it for the better. Um, and again, hi, just highlighting things that are still trending. Um, I should I, compact roundabouts, temporary roundabouts. Um, got an image up there, upper right, uh, from a project. They ripped out a signal and we're putting in a multi-lane roundabout. And the minute they tore out that signal and put, basically put barrels in the middle of the road, the, the intersection was operating more efficiently with the barrels than it did with the signal for years. Um, so that was part of a, a construction project that ended up very, uh, very well. Um, innovative construction methods, methods in terms of design build, in, in terms of CMGC, um, those are, again, great uh, oftentimes opportunities that you can have uh, roundabouts incorporated and you can see a better project. We're going to talk about education campaigns. Um, we've talked a little bit about intersection control evaluation before, where, again, there's lots of tools out there now where you can compare um, alternatives. Uh, turbo roundabouts, I've touched on that, and then metering of roundabouts and that in, in urban environments. That's another one where we don't have research here in the U.S. I hope we can get some research on metering. And that's, you know, during peak periods where you actually put a, put a red light up, you stop one of the legs maybe to let, let the traffic flow. Again, we've got examples that's been temporarily done in uh, Washington State, and you actually have the Clearwater, Florida example um, that have been around for years. Uh, but really, ha it has not been mainstreamed at this point in time. And we, we, we have case studies, but we definitely don't have research. So education. Um, again, just a couple of highlights. I know I, I think Letty uh, Champs on the call. Um, I'm going to maybe ask her to, to comment when we open the phone lines up. But just new ways to educate. So this is a new, uh, a new uh, floor mat that Federal Highways that we put together just to kind of have at our, our informational booths or if we're a vendor, we actually had this at NACE um, two weeks ago. You can see I'm standing there with Gene Russell. Um, Gene Russell was there. The NACE meeting was in Kansas. And again, you could, people can walk through that. So we're always thinking of new ways that we can help educate. The uh, National Center on Rural Road Safety is actually going to be taking this to a, a team safety conference. And again, hopefully to generate some discussion about roundabouts and, and driving multi-lane roundabouts. So thinking outside of the box um, and, and always coming up with new ideas. I'm just going to mention here, uh, Hilliard's got some great new videos out there. Um, and I, I, Letty, thank you always. You let me use your, your back as, as one of my images in terms of the roundabout rules. Uh, the city of Hilliard has, has, has stepped it up in terms of education, and you are to be applauded. There's a lot of things that now um, you all can borrow from the city of Hilliard. They even got our Deputy uh, Federal Highway Administrator, um, Brandy Hedrickson, to do um, a little video for them as part of their rollout. So um, again, please, if you've not seen the new videos, um, check it out. And again, Letty, if you want to put anything in the chat pod or mention anything when they open the phone lines up, please do. Um, and of course, last but not least here, your conference. Um, I, again, you're the only state that I know now that it's holding an annual roundabout conference. Um, I think, gosh, you guys get almost as many people as we do at our TRB Roundabout Conference. So, uh, again, September 13th, so look for details um, and registration for that. And, and, Victoria, I assume you'll probably be looking for abstracts again, and you can, you can mention that briefly. Um, from my perspective, your previous two have been um, outstanding. Um, I'm always learning something from, from you all in Ohio. And I think that um, that's the best way that we can get better as a profession and with roundabouts is by working and communicating with each other.
So I'm back. I'm almost done here. And if, so if there's any questions or if you want to open up the line, Victoria. Okay. I, well, I've got two you. more questions in the chat pod. Um, and Letty put a comment in that said, actually, ODOT created the videos with our assistance. Kudos to Michelle May and her team. And then she put in a link for the um, videos. So do you want to do the three questions or do you want me to open the phone lines? It's up to you because it's 11 o'clock. So I want to be respectful of people's times. But uh, Hillary, if you're OK with staying on, we can keep going. Sure, absolutely. OK, let me catch these three questions that we've got here in the chat pod and then um, we can go ahead and get the phone lines opened up. We had one that says we have several low speed 25 mile per hour posted residential neighborhood intersections with unusual geometry and very large intersection pavement areas that promote speeding and awkward flow patterns. What is your opinion about creating a central island area smaller than typical mini roundabout dimensions that facilitates roundabout operation without performing a full project? So I think that's very intriguing. So I'm trying to envision um, your example that, that was described there. Um, immediately, I think of mini roundabout or compact design, even a double roundabout, depending on how all those legs come in. I think that we, there's good examples out there where we've been innovative, we've done low cost, and even kind of do it as a, a pilot, if I can call it. I, I hope you're familiar with what Washington State has done uh, north of Bellingham, Washington, off of I-5. They have put in, I'm going to call what probably were originally temporary mini roundabouts. They're not real pretty, so they're not going to win a beauty contest when it comes to pretty roundabouts. However, they're very functional. They have worked and they have solved the problem that they had, and it was more of an operational problem that they had. I've also seen temporary mini roundabouts put in, again, with some paint, um, with uh, some raised pavement markers, some signs that have gone very well. Um, and so I think thinking outside of the box, I love the way you're thinking there with that example. Again, if you want to follow up or if there's a, a specific um, location, I, I think you're talking about, um, I would love to have some ideas. I, I've done this in Connecticut. They had a really wonky, awkward intersection. It was signalized and it was, it was a mess. And we looked at, we just kind of started sketching. How could you get a variation of a roundabout, um, kind of with an odd shaped center island um, that was traversable in this location to improve both operations and safety. So I love you thinking outside of the box. Do you want to follow up either with me or with, you know, anyone on the, on the call, I'll say, please let me know. From a visual search perspective, what is the recommended effective lateral cone of vision we typically go by when drivers are about to negotiate the curb return? For example, 20 degree each side or 40 degree each side, taking into consideration of nighttime operations. Okay, so this is one that I'm probably not going to take on right at this moment because it will take me some thinking. So. Cone of vision versus, I guess, sight distance would be some clarification that I would want to. So again, if whoever that question is, if you want to give a little, some more details or maybe a little bit of a sketch in terms of that, again, obviously speed is going to definitely affect our sight distance, our cone of vision, all of those sorts of things. So I'm just going to stop there because I don't want to misinterpret this question here at the end. Okay, one last question. What is current guidance on posting advisory speed plaques in advance of a roundabout? So advisory speed plaques at, in the METCD are, it, it, it's an option. Um, they are not required. Again, very few signs are required for uh, a roundabout. Um, I personally, um, I like them. Um, I like to see them on high speed approaches. I like to see them on um, urban and suburban. If you've got a series of roundabouts, you may not need them in advance of, you know, of every single roundabout. But advisory speed to me, I really think that those, that's a great indicator to the driver. Think about where else we see advisory speed plates on our roadway network. Okay, so hopefully you guys are thinking, oh, I see them on loop ramps. I see them on uh, maybe tight curves in a rural environment, that information is valuable to the driver. And I think that they can enhance the understanding of uh, the roundabout and in terms of what level of you know, information that we're giving, particularly if the posted speed you know, is greater than let's say 30 miles per hour, 35 miles per hour. 
So in my practice, I always will comment on a plan using an advisory fee plate. All right, I'm going to go ahead and open the phone lines up now. So if you happen to have a party going on in the background, I would ask you to please ask them to tone it down. My, my party folks are out of the office today, so it's a good day for us to have this webinar. Um, so anyway, I'm going to open the phone lines up, and that way we can get um, questions asked through the audio. So I ha did the general unmute, but now I'm going to go through and unmute each person individually like I need to. So Hillary, if there's anything else you want to add while I'm doing this. Sure. I would just say again, um, there's my contact information. I appreciate the great questions that you guys put in the chat pod. Um, I purposely tried to leave more time for Q&A. I know sometimes um, we get short on that. I'm really looking forward to your conference that's coming up in September. Uh, again, lean on each other, rely on each other. You've got a great network in Ohio um, with uh, consultants and agencies that uh, are working towards good roundabout projects. And I think the more you guys communicate, um, you know, the better off um, you all are in terms of your projects. Learn from each other. And, you know, oftentimes we we tend toward the extremes, the great, the, the, the perfect project and then the one that maybe, oh gosh, why are we having that issue? Share everything because we can all learn, it. we can all learn from each other and you know what, if you're first, that's okay. If you're first with the first turbo, you're first with the first double, you're first with the first mini, that's okay. Um, and there's, there's some level of um, unknown with that. Um, but I really encourage you to, to um, continue doing the good work that you guys are doing in Ohio. Okay. You know, if people have questions, they can go ahead and check and see if they're unmuted. Um, go ahead and start asking them. I've gotten everyone who's called in from just a general phone line unmuted. And as far as uh, uh, names, I've, I'm almost through with everybody whose first name begins with a D. So feel free to ask audio questions. And I'll mention, too, uh, one thing we were working on, the LTAP Center, in conjunction with the Buckeye Hills RTPO um, in Morgan County, Ohio, is we're actually going to try like a, a, um, a roundabout driving day for seniors um, down in that county. And for anyone else who really wants to come and try, we're going to set up at the fairgrounds a, um, a temporary roundabout and invite people to come during a certain period of time and just drive through it as many times as they want to get a feel for how it works and hopefully that help them get more comfortable for an upcoming roundabout that's going to be opening in their community. So that's a, another piece of education and outreach that we're hoping will, will really help because that, you know, we know roundabouts are safer than intersections. It's just getting the drivers comfortable with that. So, Victoria, when is that a great idea? When is that? Well, we're shooting for this summer, and I can definitely send out more information on it. Um, we're still getting all the details put together. The goal is to have it um, happen before their roundabout actually opens down in that community. And then my thought was, if this works really well, we could package it up and, and help others, um, you know, do something similar in their community, maybe at their fairgrounds, if they'd be interested. So, okay. Yeah, I've and got... I would encourage, yeah, Victoria, I would say I would encourage anyone that might be thinking about that. If some, like, generally, we've called those roundabout rodeos. Um, oh, okay. Record that if you can. Um, sure. Because that has been great, great information to have and then to share with others. We know like Florida's done that, um, a lot of other states and drones, it's making it a little bit easier to do things like that. But that mm -hmm. is a huge education piece that if you can capture and record, mm -hmm. you can share with so many other people. And the fact that you've got that target audience there um, is, is really, uh, is really a great a great thing. Yeah, we're bundling it with the Department of Health, and the plan is to do more than just the roundabout experience. You know, have other items there for that demographic to bring them in, maybe some health screenings and things like that, too. So everybody on the call is unmuted now. If you're still with us, you want to ask Hillary questions, you'll just have to speak up. I got a question um, regarding the approaches um, with the, the Having a tangent in between uh, the curves, a lot of other states have uh, adopted that. What's your opinions on having that? 
So again, I tend to be a visual person, so I'm, I just drew myself a little picture here. Um, so, and, and when you say tangent, you're, you're saying basically the reverse curves, but you actually have, you actually are putting a tangent between the two curves on the Splitter Island approach? Yeah, that's correct. Okay. So, you know, again, I, I'm not too, I guess, I think it's fine. As long as it drives, one of the things that I always think of is how does that drive, um, so it, how does that drive for the person who's approached? And you have to think about the trucks, you have to think about the cars. Um, I think that that is an important piece, but I've seen so many different flavors of the designs on the Splitter Islands that that's not throwing up alarms to me, but again, I tend to be a more visual person in terms of what that might look like. Um, I think we haven't, there is no, um, I think we need to be flexible in this, absolutely. There is no exact Splitter Island design that's going to work absolutely everywhere. And I think as long as we, again, have good speed control, um, and we, then that is, that is one of the most critical pieces of really that approach is good speed control and the visibility of the driver. And if we're achieving those things, I think what it looks like is second to good speed control, good deflection um, on that design. Okay, who else has questions out there? There's still 128 of you on here, so you must have some questions if you're hanging out with us past the end time. Going once, twice. Okay, maybe they just wanted to hear everybody else's questions. All right, Hillary, thank you so much for doing this webinar for us. We really appreciate it, and we are so looking forward to hosting you here in Ohio again this year for our Roundabouts Conference. Sounds great. Really look forward to seeing you. And again, if with those follow-up questions, um, please let me know and get get with Victoria or myself and uh, look forward to And give me a call. Um, it's probably the best way to get a hold of me. So have a safe day and uh, look forward to seeing you all in September. Thanks, Hillary. You too. Bye-bye, everyone.